Welcome to Oregon State University's uh, Farm to Fork webinar series. My name is Sherry Cole. I'm an assistant professor in the Food Science and Technology Department at OSU, and I'll be your moderator for today. We want to thank you first for taking the time to join us. We know that you all have a lot competing for your attention, and we really appreciate your interest in the stories that we're bringing you. Our objectives behind this series is really to expand the conversation about food systems and how they work, and in particular, the people behind them that are driving change to make them more sustainable. Part of the interest in the stories that we bring to you are we really wanna reflect the diversity of all of the things that are happening in our food systems. And so today is a really great example of that. Before I introduce today's speaker, I just wanna go through briefly some logistics. First, we're recording the webinar. Um, we do that and post it on our, our uh, Farm to Fork website. Um, and so we encourage you to check that out and share that with other people um, as a resource. Second, um, we really want this to be as much of a conversation as it can be. So we've reserved the last 15 minutes for your questions, but I really encourage you throughout the, the presentation to check out the Q&A feature, share your questions. And then the other thing you'll see in Q&A is the opportunity to upvote. And so if you see a question that you like and you're really interested in having our speaker answer, then upvote that and those all rise to the top of the list. So it's my uh, pleasure to introduce today's presentation, Grape Smoke Exposure Impacts to Wine Quality. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Elizabeth Tomasino. Thank you very much, Sherry. Thank you all for joining me. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Yes, I did unmute myself. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I am an associate professor at Oregon State University in the food science department. I'm also a member of the Oregon Wine Research Institute, um, and I do a lot of research dealing with grape smoke exposure and impacts to wine quality, um, as well as sort of um, bringing together a team um, to work on the, the many problems that are occurring. So today I'm going to sort of take you through the issue and then I'm going to introduce you to some of the work that is currently going on here at OSU. So I'm sure as everyone can sort of see from the background of the picture, this is quite dramatic, but an actual picture from the 2020 vintage. This is from California. So we have the fire actually burning over the ridge into the vineyard for it. Most of us may be really familiar with issues dealing with smoke from a human health aspect. Um, there's also, of course, the destruction of property and buildings. But particularly today, we're going to talk about why this is a problem in agriculture, specifically with the grape and wine industry. So just a little bit of background information on wildfires, the incidences of wildfires wildfires have been increasing for about 10 to 15 years and it's not just the number of wildfires it's actually the season in which they are happening so that season is getting a lot wider it's starting to overlap with fire season in other parts of the world we've also seen in the past 10 years or so that while the number of wildfires are, are increasing a bit beyond just that we actually hit a little bit of a plateau the past five years but the acreage that is being burned is going up exponentially for it. So um, it's more difficult to manage some of these fires. And I've put this middle picture up here. This is from firenow.gov um, website. This was last year. For those of you that were on the West Coast last year in the month of September, um, the coast was essentially on fire. California all the way up to Washington. Anything green is considered normal, what we'd all like to breathe. Um, this dark purple, they, it's actually off the air quality scale. I sort of tease people that you should stop breathing, but it's so bad that you really shouldn't even breathe at all um, for it. And you can just see all these little fires. There were fires all the way up California into Oregon, Washington, over into Idaho. This is becoming more and more the norm. And of course, there's this huge cloud of smoke you can see that, that on that day was a little more pushing out into the ocean. But for those of you that remember this year, actually with the jet stream, the smoke cloud made it all the way out to the East Coast this year. And I have family in New York and was getting these pictures of, of saying, you know, what is this haze 
And I just said, welcome to the West Coast fire season for it. So we're getting a lot more and it's impacting a lot more things beyond just air quality and property. We are having some impacts to agricultural crops. Now you might say, why is this a problem? There are lots of lovely foods that are smoked. I have a few examples up here where people smoke things on purpose. Um, and there are some things that, that smoking is good. These are done in very controlled scenarios where they know what the fuel is for it. There are certainly some things that are burned during wildfires that you would not want to use for, for the fuel for your smoked out foods. What we're talking about with, with impacts to wine quality is the level of smoke exposure is getting so high that it's negatively affecting quality. And I'm going to go into a little bit of how this works. So there is sort of a level of, you know, a little bit of smoke exposure not going to be problematic, um, but it's starting to have so much smoke exposure during the year that it's negatively impacting quality to the point where people are not interested in purchasing those products with those qualities. I mean, winemakers are not even releasing said products because it's, a, it's affecting quality so much. So while you might, you might say, hey, but lots of things are smoked, it's nice. When it comes to wine quality, the levels we're talking about, it is considered very detrimental to quality. So wine, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause, cause for those of you that might enjoy drinking wine or tasting wine, sometimes there's a little hint of smoke in wine. I'm gonna go through a little bit of the winemaking procedure, but as I said before, we're talking about the amounts of wildfire smoke that is happening here. Um, and we're getting to such extremes that um, when I have people taste this wine, they, they agree with the statement I'm gonna make for what it tastes like, but a lot of people sort of say, no, what are you talking about? If you drink your wine and you swallow it and you wait a moment, and then your, your mouth fills up with what I describe as a whole boatload of cigarette smoke, it's described as licking an ashtray, those things are not considered um, quality markers for wine. They're not good quality markers. They would be considered on the spoilage side for wine. And some work I'm gonna talk about we do is the fact that it doesn't go away particularly fast. It lingers in your mouth. So this is not that nice, pleasant smoke you might experience from smoked salmon or smoked meat. This is a very, very sort of cringeworthy smoke when it's getting at those concentrations. And when people do taste heavily smoke tainted wines, you do sort of see this, the faces they make are, are they're clearly not having a pleasant experience with it. So understanding smoke taint and smoke exposure, um, how it affects grape quality, how it affects wine quality is very important so that we can develop strategies for the industry so that you can either prevent or mitigate this problem. The perfect way to fix this problem, of course, is to not have wildfires. Um, that is something everyone would like, but unfortunately, it's certainly not going to happen um, overnight. Um, there's a lot of forest management things that have to change and climate aspects we have to deal with. But we can start to develop strategies to prevent and or mitigate or fix said problem should it could happen. And that's what a lot of work is focused on. Um, so that each year, irrespective of the differences in weather, things like that, the grape and wine industry can still produce quality products. So first off, I wanted to talk a little bit about what we're really referring to when we talk about grape smoke exposure and smoke taint. In, in a really brief statement, it's think about all those compounds that make smoke smell like smoke. They're aroma compounds that smell like smoke. And essentially what is happening is those smoke compounds, um, when the smoke is in the vineyard, are getting transferred into the grape. The specific compounds we're looking at presently are called smoke-derived volatile phenols. And I have several of them up here. So guaiacol, formethyl, guaiacol, syringol, the cresols. These compounds are formed when wood burns. So they're degradation products of lignin. So anything that is plant-based will produce these volatile phenols. Different wood sources and, and fuel sources also have other compounds, but these volatile phenols are um, found in sort of all burning woody plants for it. 
So we have to sort of, and oh, I went a little too fast. Sorry about that. So, and what happens, or I might not have ordered these. Here we go. So what happens when smoke is in the vineyard? So the growing season for grapes, and it differs every single year. And I know there's a viticultural too on here um, watching this. So apologies if I don't do my growing season quite right. Grapes are essentially spring, summer into fall. So this year we picked um, our grapes for our research in the middle of September. Um, and you start seeing sort of berries or green berries, um, grape berries, sort of June, July. So it's not all year round. It's sort of this season where, of course, wildfires are more present. And grapes are actually some of the later crops grown um, compared to other products as well. So they, their um, time period for exposure is quite large compared to other crops. For other crops. So when we have smoke in the vineyard, you're out there, you can see the smoke, but you can also smell the smoke. And it's the smell we're really concerned about. Those volatile phenols in the air get deposited on the grape skin and then they're absorbed into the cellular structure of the grapes. I get the, I get the question all the time, if we just wash the grapes, won't that take care of the problem? The answer is no, you can't wash the smoke compounds off. They're actually absorbed into the cellular structure of the skin um, on there. So we've got them primarily in the skin, at least at the moment, primarily in the skin, but we don't necessarily taste smoky. And this is because what happens once the smoke compounds get absorbed. When the smoke compounds get, when we smell smoke compounds in the air, they're free. So over here on the left, this is a, this is a smoke phenol compound. Here, it's not bound to anything. That's its compound itself. You're gonna go and it's like, oh wow, it smells like glycol. And then it's absorbed into the grape and due to the other composition in the grape, sugars and things like that, this compound gets bound. So over here we have sugars, it's bound to sugar. Now, once those compounds become bound to sugars and other things, they're no longer aroma active. So you can't smell or taste those compounds. So if you had a smoke event in your vineyard, it clears up, you go out and say, I'm gonna taste my grapes, see if there's a problem. You taste your grapes, your grapes taste fine. Not an issue at all. It's because all those smoke compounds are bound. What happens during fermentation, which I'll go over in a second, is all those bound compounds are released again to free compounds. So further, as fermentation happens, all of a sudden your wine is starting to smell smoky for it. And it's particularly red wine that has this problem. And for those of you that, that don't know anything about winemaking, I'm gonna give you the one big difference between white wines and red wines. So white wines, we pick our grapes, they get crushed and pressed. So the skins are separated from the juice and then the juice go through fermentation. So skins are removed prior to fermentation. For red fermentation, the grapes are picked, they're crushed, and then all of those skins go with the juice and go through fermentation. So the skins are present through fermentation. That's where that lovely red color comes through too. And it isn't until after fermentation that pressing happens where the skins are removed. So this is really important for smoke because as I said before, the skin really has all of those smoke compounds in it. So you might have lots of smoke compounds in your grapes, but you're not necessarily gonna notice a problem the quality in white wine because most of the smoke compounds were removed with the skins. They weren't extracted into your wine. Unfortunately, with red wine, because you need to have the skins present during fermentation, all of those compounds get extracted into the red wine. Um, and then all of a sudden, partway through fermentation, you're going to start noticing um, some smoky characteristics start to, to occur for it. Um, and then actually the smokiness will get worse over time until about nine months. This release of bound smoke compounds in the grapes takes some time. Wine has quite a low pH, quite a bit of acid. This release of smoke compounds from sugars is um, catalyzed due to the acidic condition. So over time as wine ages, more smoke compounds will be released. So it's not until approximately nine months to a year after fermentation that winemakers will know the full extent of the smoke impact from grape exposure on their wine. 
this is a problem because of course, if you wines are gonna be very problematic with smoke, you'd like to have done something about it beforehand, but you're not necessarily going to know about it until you, you at the end. So a lot of work is really focusing on, can we do a better job predicting the level of smoke that is happening in wine? So we have our grapes, smoke is absorbed into the skins here. This is just a little graph that shows within 24 hours, those free smoke compounds get bound into sugars. So they become, they become bound really quickly. Um, we know multiple smoke exposures. So say there's a fire in June and your grapes get smoked. And then there's a fire in July and your grapes get smoked. It's, um, it's, it keeps adding more smoke compounds, so it accumulates. So we haven't quite worked out if there's a maximum that occurs yet. Um, in research, as little as one hour of smoke can accumulate enough smoke compounds to be a problem. Think about those multiple days of smoke that some police places have um, experienced. Now I'm gonna get into some more of the what makes this complicated and difficult for the wine industry. And I'm sure you're like, it already sounds complicated. How much worse can this get? So when grapes are most um, susceptible to absorbing smoke compounds um, throughout the, the berry formation, grape ripening depends on the varietal. So some grape compounds tend to absorb smoke compounds better when they're younger. Others do it closer to harvest. It depends on the grape varietal. The type of grape also depends on which of the smoke compounds is absorbed the most. So some, some grape varieties um, favor certain smoke compounds over others for it. Um, that what we call the age of the smoke is really important. So over time, those smoke smelling compounds do degrade. So you're gonna have a lot more of a problem from smoke exposure if you're really close to the source of the fire versus if you're um, quite a bit far away. A lot of things that go into this is the speed of the wind and the temperature at the time. It's, it's not quite easy to predict. So for instance, in Oregon, Southern Oregon traditionally gets more smoke exposure than other aspects just because of its proximity to California. And California has had so many wildfires. Um, the smoke that from Northern California in particular does go up and sometimes affect Southern Oregon. Um, but we sort of like to talk about it. The closer, closer you are to the burn site, the more smoke compounds there are that will get absorbed into the grapes. And then of course, I mentioned beforehand how you process the grapes will also affect how much smoke you have in your wine. With white grapes versus red grapes, there's also a lot of other processes that go in that can affect extraction of smoke compounds. So what we're looking at from a research standpoint is number one, can we stop the smoke compounds from going into the grapes in the first place? Um, are, should that happen? Should we not be able to stop that? Are there processing we can do when we're making wine to either minimize the amount of smoke compounds that are getting into the wine, or can we process those compounds so they're removed and or bound up some way so you can no longer smell them? As I said before, they're bound to sugars and grapes and you can't smell them. What if we could bind them to something in wine so you can't smell them anymore? We're also working with um, some other universities to look at things like if we can measure the amount of smoke in the air, can we make a prediction on the level of um, smoke exposure and how problematic that would be in the grape. So it's a very, very big sort of scheme of things we could do at, at very different um, time points. I'm in particular gonna take you through um, just a little bit of research being done at OSU here. I'm sure there'll be plenty of questions. We don't have lots of answers yet. There's been research going on for years, but we're only starting to come across um, finding some answers that are gonna be useful to the wine industry. So one of the big projects we have going on here at OSU, um, not just at OSU, but also um, a few other places around the world. As I mentioned, those smoke phenols we think are very important 
the cause of those sort of ashtray-like tastes in the mouth. Um, but we don't get really good prediction for if you're going to have a problem or not if you measure those um, for it. So we're actually, we have a project here at OSU where we created carbon-13 labeled fuel. For those of you that don't remember your isotopes or chemistry, most carbon in life is carbon-12. And there's very teeny tiny amounts of carbon-13 out there. We grew barley specifically to have elevated levels of carbon-13. Um, and we actually managed to achieve between three and 5% um, carbon-13 in our barley. So that then when we burn the barley and expose grapes to the smoke from the burned barley, we're going to be tracking the carbon-13. So anything that has elevated carbon-13 to hopefully be able to get a much better idea of the compounds that we should be measuring to determine if grapes and wine are going to have a problem. So having a really reliable test close to harvest or right after harvest is really important for the wine industry for helping them make decisions about what they should do. We want to try and give them their level of risk sooner rather than later because the chances of them being able to mitigate some of the issue is much um, would be much more successful the earlier they know if there's a problem. And while there are certain tests that are being done, it's not as predictive of risk as we would like it to be. So we're really trying to use this carbon-13 labeling to specifically see which compounds we should be looking at. So what you have here is we're growing barley in our greenhouses. Then we have some special cages. This was post-harvest smoking, but this year we did actually smoke out in the vineyard. We create these big cages where we essentially pipe in smoke and do smoke exposure to the grapes. And then we go through and make wine and do sensory on the wine. And we're almost done with our winemaking for this year. And we started the analysis for um, all of these grapes. So we did it on Pinot Noir and Chardonnay um, specifically so we can see exactly what is coming from the smoke. And hopefully we should be able to find a much better marker for smoke exposure risk for that. We also do a lot of sensory here. This is a specific area um, of expertise for me. As I mentioned before, that sort of smoky taste in wine um, can linger for a really long time. That becomes problematic when we're doing research from a methodology standpoint. Um, also, personally, as someone who gets asked to taste smoky wine all the time, I really don't want that lingering in my mouth. Um, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. So if we can get that out as soon as possible, that's good. So we've done a lot of work on figuring out how long the smoke lasts. In a lot of research, we think they're actually getting false positives because they're tasting wines too quickly. So for instance, if you take a very smoky wine and then a minute later go taste another wine, the chances of you saying, hey, that wine is smoky is really high because it's you still have that smoky aromas in your mouth. Um, that second wine might actually not have any smoke, but you didn't wait long enough for that smoke of, um, compounds to dissipate. So you're actually judging several wines that probably aren't smoke affected as smoky because of that carryover between samples. There also is differences in in your saliva and enzymes in your mouth. People are very, the sensitivity of people is very different. Um, so we're, we're starting to look into why certain people are more sensitive than others. I'm a medium sensitivity to smoke. Um, and the reason I know this is because we had a really smoky wine. Everyone in the lab tasted it. Two of the students um, flinched so badly and actually yelled at me for, for giving them such a smoked wine. Whereas I was like, it's smoky, but it's not that bad. And then I had one student who didn't taste it smoky at all. And we know from testing lots of smoked wines that there are some people that don't taste smoke and or find it objectionable. There are some people um, who are very sensitive who find little amounts of this smoke really objectionable very quickly um, for it. And then another area we're looking at is are there ways we could mask the perception of this smoke? for it. So wine has a lot of different aroma compounds in it, hundreds of them. If we can change something during fermentation to maybe make our wine taste more floral, perhaps, that might mask the smokiness so it's no longer objectionable. So we're looking at what we call a bunch of compound interactions. 
So if we mix different compounds with the smoke compounds, can we, can we alter the perception of, of that smoke so it's not objectionable anymore? So for those of you who might be near campus, we will be doing lots of wine sensory over the next couple of years. If you feel a burning desire to come in and, and taste some smoky wine for us for research for that. We're also looking at what we call the threshold levels for these smoke compounds. So what concentration can you notice it tastes smoky? Because as I said before, lower concentration is not necessarily a problem. We need to know what concentration that's a problem. And then we want to know what concentration, we call it a rejection threshold, when people wouldn't ever purchase or taste that wine. It's so high, they consider it so bad. And those are really important numbers for the industry. So they can do processing and mitigation to keep everything underneath those quality levels for it. Um, and we're gonna be starting that this spring for it. Um, come on, what's the problem here? There we go. We've been working with Dr. Yan Yan Zhao, um, Dr. Alec Levin and Dr. Mike Penner here at OSU. Um, Alec Levin is down at the Southern Oregon Research Center trying to develop new grape coatings um, or grape films to prevent smoke absorption. So we want to go to that first point. Let's see if we can stop them from getting into the grapes in the first place. There has been quite a bit of work on this with, with different sprays that are already used in the wine industry. Um, those are not actually successful at stopping smoke compounds from being absorbed. They actually can make the problem worse. So we're using some different materials that are currently used in other industries um, to stop the smoke compounds from being absorbed in. The first application of this occurred in Southern Oregon this year um, and grapes were picked in September. And we also applied these coatings to grapes that were picked um, here at Woodhall Vineyard at OSU. And we sprayed coatings and did a post-harvest smoking and, and made wine to see um, which ones would be effective at stopping smoke. We can say that the coatings didn't affect grape growth at all. The grapes still looked good. We still had plenty of sugar. Um, it didn't stop anything with ripening or affect it with ripening. Looks like it might've stopped a little botrytis as a side note to that, but we didn't see it affect sort of grape development or grape ripening in any way. And there was a little bit of um, natural smoke event in Southern Oregon. So we're gonna be measuring the, the um, efficacy of using it um, at stopping smoke compounds from that trial. But the trial where we, we applied it and smoked grapes out over harvest was also to see in really, really high smoke levels, um, how effective were these coatings at stopping the smoke from going into the grapes. And as I mentioned before, we're almost done with winemaking for those. So we'll start going into smoke analysis for it. We're looking at volatile phenol de degradation pathways with Chris, Dr. Chris Curtin here in Food Science and Technology. He's a fermentation microbiologist, looking at different enzymes. And if there's a way to, I'm gonna use this word very specifically, to selectively degrade the smoke compounds. There are a lot of phenolic compounds in wine. Most of them we want. They're, they do things like um, affect the mouthfeel and taste of wine and the color. They're really important. If we go on there and just degrade all phenolic compounds, you're going to alter the quality in wines in ways you don't want. So a lot of this mitigation is being really specific and selective at removing just those um, smoke compounds that are problematic. Um, so Dr. Curtin's going to be looking at some enzymes from different microbes um, to see if we can get a really selective um, product that can be used to remove those smoke compounds. And that's new research that's starting up this year here at OSU. We're also going to be looking at smoke and oak interactions with Tom Collins up at Washington State University. As I mentioned earlier, barrels are used in winemaking. They burn or we call it toast but they, they apply fire to the interior barrels. Um, and then the barrels are used in winemaking for it. Um, and you certainly don't get objectionable wine or smoky notes from this type of work. It's only with a lot of smoke exposure from wildfires where it's really negatively impacted. So there's, I think there's quite a bit of information we can figure out looking at oak compounds versus the smoke compounds from wildfires 
and trying to see if, if by maybe altering use of oak in the winemaking process, we may be able to mask or mitigate some of the sensory perception of those smoke compounds. This year, James Osborne, myself, and Dr. Cole Serrato here at OSU. Um, I feel like I should be giving you guys a lecture on phenolic chemistry because that's what a lot of this research is about. Um, he does micro oxygenation of smoke compounds. So this is something that is used sometimes in the wine industry. I'm gonna call it MOX for short because I always stumble over that word. Um, MOX is sometimes used where they dose really small amounts of oxygen into wine during fermentation. Um, it alters the phenolic structure. It can change the mouthfeel and taste. Our thought is if we can um, put small amounts of oxygen in during fermentation, we can potentially cause a chemical cascade so the smoke compounds bind to other phenolic compounds in wine. And when those smoke compounds bind to the other phenolic compounds, you can't perceive them anymore. So you're not going to smell or taste the smoke. And those things will stay bound um, for forever. It's not a reversible reaction in this case um, for it. So um, James is did his first dosage this year um, during winemaking. And again, that winemaking is finishing up. Um, for it. And those are the main projects going on. We have a few other little ones. Again, not a lot of results, but it's we're going to have some exciting things over the next couple of years for it. I did want to thank uh, a number of people. There is quite a big team here, a number of students that are trained, as you saw, a number of PIs. We have great industry partners to do this. Our current main funding sources are the American Vineyard Foundation, the USDA Northwest Center for Small Fruits Research, and the USDA ARS services for it. Um, I feel like I'm running out of time, so I'll wrap that up. But of course, you can always contact me if there are any questions you weren't able to get to today in this uh, webinar. So I will bring it back to questions. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. It's, uh, you know, it's clearly an extremely complicated topic. Um, and so it's, it's, it's really gratifying to see, I think, how much work there is and how to use the expertise, certainly at the university, but also just like the broad collaborative network. So congratulations and thanks for that. Oh, thank um, we have a number of questions in the Q&A. So if others, if you, if you have any, I encourage you to um, include them uh, now. First one is noting that more is burning than just wood and vegetative material. Are there risks that we're finding from anything that's more dangerous to ingest? For example, plastic, heavy metals, et cetera. Right. So we haven't, um, yes, there are certainly things that are burning. And for anyone that has been even remotely near, particularly houses, equipment that burns, just smelling it is um, much more unpleasant compared to, say, a tree burning down for it. Um, there are a lot of people that look at this from human health to date. A lot of those compounds that are problematic to human health, we have not seen being absorbed. There are people looking at this, but but currently think about, you have to think about more of it's like the smoked salmon you might have had at the store. Those are levels that it's not problematic. So we haven't seen anything that would be problematic from a consumption standpoint to date. And there's a follow-up to that question, which is, is there anything that can be done from the clarification process that can remove compounds introduced via smoke taint? So to my knowledge, and this has been looked at, the issue is the selectivity of that. So I know people have looked at different fining agents. You strip out a lot more than just smoke compounds. So that's, that's an issue. A lot of people don't want to alter the other aspects of their wine. They just need the smoke to come out. So that selectivity is, is problematic. And so we don't recommend anything um, over anything else just because you remove a lot more than just smoke when you use clarification agents. Thanks. Next question is from Mike, and it is, can smoke compounds work their way into the root structure, and would that affect the fruit? So that's a great question, and we don't know about that yet. There has been some work that has looked at um, if the smoke can be absorbed through the leaves and work their way through the fruit, um, and we're, we also did a little bit of a trial to look at that today. Um, I know we've discussed it before with someone and we don't think it's an issue, but at the same time, we also haven't figured out how to design that study if it was a problem, because it would be looking more from an ash standpoint, any ash that was deposited 
on the ground um, for it. I don't think anyone's seen it yet, but I also, it's a little tricky to design something to work that out. <laughs> Thank you. The next question is from Amanda, who says hi. She says, so when the grapes are green, very low, whoops, sorry, it shifted to the bottom, uh, very low sugar levels just because of time. Is it possible to taste the smoke flavor because the compounds are in the free form? Could this be an alternative uh, of using thinned grapes to make a smoked verju, which I wonder if that's taste. Oh, that's her expertise, if I remember correctly. I So I, I know that, and because of the difficulties of doing what we call research smoking, which require these huge cage, cages and things out in the vineyard for it, certain grapes absorb them earlier. So when you would be in sort of that verju stage for your grapes for it, and they still bind up those compounds. Um, I don't know if verju would be a, a way to go as a way to predict. We do recommend doing these small ferments as, as a couple of weeks before harvest is a predictor for if you're going to have a problem or not. Um, but I don't think anyone has ever, we normally let the grapes ripen. I should say for it. So that's a great question. Maybe we'll have to look into that next time. Thank you. And then a follow-up from Amanda. Are you using any sensory temporal techniques to evaluate the wines? If so, which one? Oh, yes, we are. Um, this is Jenna's area for it. Amanda, we need a paper published for it. So I'll maybe send you for that. Um, I want to, it's not a tea cata. Um, is it a tea cata? It might be a tea cata, Amanda. I'll have to send you the paper. Um, uh, next question from Andrew. How would you change it during fermentation, i.e. make it more floral? So um, you can choose different yeast strains. You can change the temperature of your fermentation. There are some products you can add. Um, I'm not talking like adding floral aroma, but like um, products you can add that could bind up other compounds so the floral can come out. You could use different fermentation containers. I just use floral as an example, but there are actually a lot of different choices for the different processes you make and a lot of products available from the the um like Lalmond and scott labs and things like that that you can add different nutrients that will push different aromas so so there's a lot of different ways you can change your wine just currently we don't quite know what would be recommended to mask those smoke compounds yet this is a question about the correlation between consumers who smoke and their ability to keep yourself up to these flavors. Many professional chefs smoke and won't quit because they fear it will affect their finely tuned palate. Is there a correlation between smokers and sensitivity to that taste in wine? I think that would actually a question someone asked us not about smokers, because actually if you smoke, we don't allow you to participate in our wine research wine sensory stuff. But we're thinking of asking people how much they like smoke food and or consume it. So I have a very good friend who likes smoked food who participated in one of our earliest panels and he could not perceive the smoke in wine. So we actually, we, we were going to look into it. We think that would be interesting to see for it. Um, I would argue that the chefs don't have a good a palate as they think if they're smokers. <laughs> uh, next question is from Hannah. Uh, if C12 is more common, then why is the research being done with using C13? So C13, we have some analytical techniques. So you're not changing anything in the smoke compound except for it has an additional neutron on it. So it's a little heavier. Um, there's some specific NMR that can be done that is very selective at looking at C13. So one of the reasons um, it's difficult to figure out the smoke compounds is everything has C12, all of it. Um, you're looking, there's tons of things there, but if we find, use an analytical technique that looks just at C13, that's going to be a lot easier to pinpoint the compounds just from the smoke. This question is from Doug. From a sensory analysis standpoint, we found a far greater smoke impact in our Pinot Noir than in our Gamay Noir, yep. growing just yards away. Even though the Gamay was out and exposed five to six days longer than the Pinot, we speculate that it has to do with skin thickness. Do you have a firm answer for this? I don't know about skin skin thickness, but I say yes, Pinot Noir and everything. So we did a lot of measurement for industry last year and all of the grape variety information I saw from 2020, Pinot Noir is very susceptible to smoke compounds. I don't know if it is a skin thickness. You also have to realize the phenolics of Pinot Noir are different from other 
other grape varieties and some of the other um, compositional aspects are different. So we don't know if it's skin thickness versus just the fact that Pinot Noir is some different things. But yes, Pinot Noir of all the red grapes we've seen is really susceptible to smoke. Next question is from Steve. Are there any candidates that could rebind the phenols as the sugars are consumed? Uh, yes, there are candidates. And no, I'm not allowed to say what they are at the moment. <laughs> Uh, next question is, oh, one is a comment about being a proud OSU graduate. This is fantastic research. So, uh, next question is from Pashita. Uh, I'm a student from Harriet Watt University studying uh, MSC brewing and distilling. I'm interested in this research and I'm interested in participating in sensory studies. How would I prepare myself for coming into this field of research? Ah, to coming into this field of research, I think one of the best things you can do is to become very, uh, very familiar with phenolic chemistry, um, aroma composition, um, and oxidation chemistry. It's a lot of chemistry. <laughs> Thank you. Next question is from Rick. Is this research shared with other colleagues in CAS as it refers to other edible crops, underground or not? If so, whose research benefits from yours? Hashtag go bees. So we've started to talk with other um, people within the co um, College of Ag. Um, the hop industry is quite concerned. Um, I've had some conversation with the hemp industry. Um, they're actually, sometime next year, Food Science will be having a smoke lab um opening for measuring these compounds and we expect to be collaborating more and talking with more people i know i had a conversation with some people up at the north i want to say it's the north i don't remember the station northwest station that does all the berries at osu because they were concerned about some of the berry crops from last year so we, we snagged some samples and we'll be doing some smoke analysis but the thought is that a lot of these techniques would be applied to those other crops that are having could potentially have difficulties with smoke exposure in the future. Um, so that we would be developing a lot of the analytical techniques, some of the measurements in the air and things like that, that then could be applied to other crops. Uh, next question is from Doug. What's the basis you can share of the grape coating materials? Um, I'm trying to see what I can probably say about it. I suppose the only thing I can say is they are not lipid based. It's not mine to share. So I'm being very conservative about that. I work with them, but it's, I'd have to check to see like how much I can share of that. Right. Um, we have time for one more question. So I'm gonna take Lee's question, which is what's the earliest timing of smoke exposure that will impact smoke levels and harvested grapes? much earlier than we think. It was thought for a while that it was veraison. So that point where um, berry formation changed to ripening. And for those of you that don't know what that is, it's when the grapes change color for it. It used to be thought that, and for the vast majority of grapes, we still think it is at veraison or later, but I know Tom Collins up at WSU has recently done some work that has shown one or two varieties will pick up smoke before that point. It's a very varietal specific thing, which makes a lot of this work um, well, it gives you a headache a bit. Excellent. Thank you. Well, I apologize to those of you whose questions that we couldn't get to, and thank you so much for sharing them. Thank you, Elizabeth, for talking to us, you know, especially so early, I think, in the phase of this program to really get a sense of how important it is and, and what's happening um, and creating visibility so people can engage um, with, with OSU on it if they're interested. And be, um, for those who I didn't get to your questions, feel free to email me. And if for some reason you get my email, you can search for me at the OSU website and there's a contact form. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. So thanks again for those of you who joined us uh, today. We really appreciate your time.